Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Operating System Development Series. With this episode, we start Section 2, in which we will cover a lot of theory about operating systems, and we will program the basic skeleton of our operating system. Today, in the theory part we will learn about kernel designs, and later, in the practice part, we start creating the kernel. In the next episode, we will learn about memory, and we display the first text on the screen. First, we will learn about rings. Rings are a security feature of the x86 processor. They offer various levels of protection against faults, or malicious behavior. There are four rings on a standard computer. The first ring, called ring 0, or supervisor mode, has most privileges. This is where the kernel stands, so the kernel is allowed to do pretty much anything it wants. The next two rings, 1 and 2, are more restrictive than ring 0, and this is where device drivers are located. All the other applications run in ring 3, also known as user mode, and it is the most restrictive ring. If the program wants to do something it is not allowed, it should ask the kernel to do this, by making a system call. This means that the kernel still has control over the application. Now you can see why kernels are so important. They offer protection to the hardware, and they offer various services to programs, like allocating memory, or interfacing with the hardware. You can also see why faulty drivers cause a lot of trouble, like blue screens of death and sometimes even worse problems. Drivers have special privileges in comparison to ordinary applications, so malicious behavior can be dangerous. There are multiple designs of kernels, and each one has pros and cons. The most important are microkernels, and monolithic kernels. A microkernel only offers some basic functionality for applications, which includes memory management, multitasking, and inter-process communication. Other services, such as networking, are implemented in user space, and they are referred to as servers. The advantage of this design is that, it is much easier to maintain, and it is more stable. However the downside is that, because of a very large number of system calls, it costs a lot of performance. A monolithic kernel runs all the services inside kernel space. The pros are, higher speeds, and easier hardware access for these services. The downside however, is a very large kernel which is difficult to maintain, and instability, since a bug can bring down the entire system. Linux is an example of a monolithic kernel. Other kernel designs can be, hybrid kernels, nano kernels or exo kernels. A hybrid kernel, also known as a macro kernel, is a combination of the two designs. This means that some services are run in kernel space, and some others are run in user space. This design, if implemented properly, will result in more speed than a microkernel, and more stability than a monolithic kernel. The Windows NT kernel is a hybrid kernel. If it is properly implemented, well, you probably know the answer. Nano kernels or microkernels taken to the extremes. This means that even the most basic services, like interrupts, are done by services run in user space. Most kernel designs are around the idea of abstracting as much as possible. Exokernels do the exact opposite, abstracting as little as possible. This results in very high performance, but also implementing such a kernel gets very difficult. To illustrate what abstraction means, let's look at an example. An application wants to read the contents of a file. The programmer who writes the application calls a function called fread and he doesn't have to worry about anything else. The fread function belongs to the operating system's library. The function calls a server, or the kernel, depending on the kernel design. The kernel, or the server, contains the virtual file system, which links all the different devices together. This is how when you open my computer, you see all the different drives, because they are all linked to the virtual file system. The virtual file system contains information about how to access the files on a specific drive, which leads to the file system parser. The file system parser reads the actual sectors on the disk, and converts them into files and folders that applications know to handle. You see, there is a lot going on behind the fread function, but the programmer doesn't have to know all that. This is called abstraction. 
Even programming languages are classified by how much abstraction there is. For example, assembly has very little abstraction, so it is a low-level language. C and C++ are middle-level languages, and PHP, Java, C Sharp, or HTML are high or very high-level languages. HTML is such a high-level language that it is not considered a programming language. So we know abstraction is good, it hides away ugly stuff behind a really nice function we can call. But the problem is that it limits the control we have over the stuff that is happening behind. In the previous example, if the driver is implemented by Crappy Incorporated, and it has some really long delays, the application programmer cannot do anything about that. Or if the application is ran by a new user, who hits no at the dialog where Windows asks for permission to read the file, and the user blames the programmer. There is nothing the programmer can do. Unfortunately, we will continue working with the files we created in the previous episodes. Today, we will write the basic stuff to make our kernel work. Let's create a new folder called kernel in our work directory. It is always a good idea to be organized from the beginning, or you will suffer later. Inside, let's create a new file called loader.asm. This will be the entry point for our kernel. In other words, this is like the main function in a C program, the first thing that gets executed. We will write it in assembly, because there are some things that C cannot do, like setting up the stack. First, let's specify that we are working in 32-bit mode. We declare a global symbol called loader. In assembly, symbols are in fact addresses, in this case, an address to a function. Next, declare an external function called kmain. An external function means that the implementation is in another file. kmain will be the main function written in C. The next few lines contain multi-boot information. This will tell Grub that we have a multi-boot compliant kernel, and how to load it. This multi-boot thing is a standard for kernels and bootloaders, which enable any multi-boot compliant bootloader to execute any multi-boot compliant kernel. We will specify some flags, I will not go through what each of them does. The EQU keyword in assembly is similar to define in C. The magic number has a value of 1 BAPI002, and this is what tells Grub that our kernel is multi-boot compliant. The checksum is also verified by Grub to avoid executing a corrupt file. Now we write these values into memory. We will need three 32-bit blocks, containing the magic number, the flags and the checksum. Next, we need to set up a stack. The size will be 4000 bytes in hexadecimal, that is 16 kilobytes. Now we will write the loader function. First, we need to make sure our kernel was booted by a multi-boot compliant kernel. If it wasn't, the state of the computer may not be the one expected, so the kernel won't work properly. We do that by verifying that the EAX register contains the value 2 bad B002. If it is not, we will jump to the bad function. Now, we continue setting up the stack. We do that by moving the address at the end of the stack into the ESP register, because the stack grows backwards. Now we set up the registers. Put the hexadecimal 10 value in the X registry, and copy that to DS, S, FS, and GS. Push the value of EBX on the stack, and then call the main function. The bad function will stop interrupts, and halt the system. For the stack, it needs to be 4 byte aligned. And now we declare it, filled with zeros. So this is it, we finished writing the loader. Next on our menu for today is the kmain function, written in C. Let's create a new file called main.c, and open it. For now, let's create a dummy main function, which will have one parameter, a pointer to the multi-boot information given by Grub. That is what the EBX registry contained when we pushed it on the stack, the address to this information. By pushing it on the stack, the main function can retrieve the value as a parameter. We will keep it a void pointer, since we don't need the multi-boot information right now. 
Next, we need to create a script for the LD linker, a file called linker.ld. This will tell LD how to place all the different sections into the final executable. First, we specify which is the entry point for the kernel. In our case, it is the loader function we created earlier in assembly. The output file we want to be called kernel.bin. Now we will create a variable called addr, which will have the value 100,000 in hexadecimal. This is the location in memory where grub loads the kernel, which is at about 1 megabyte. Now we specify the sections. First, the text section which starts at addr. We align it to 1000 in hexadecimal, that is 4 kilobytes. The section will contain the text, that means the code, and row data, or the read-only data. The next section is the data section. We need to align it to 4 kilobytes, and this section will contain the data, that means all the initialized global and static variables. The last section is the BSS section. Same as above, align it to 4 kilobytes, and it will contain the BSS, this means all the uninitialized variables. The last file we need to create will be a shell script. This will make our lives easier, because all the compiling will be done when we launch this script. Let's call the file build.sh. First, we will specify that the shell script will be executed with sh. The sharp sign is the comment marker in shell scripts, but if we put an exclamation sign right after it, it has a totally different meaning. Next, create a variable, build, which has a value build. This will be the folder that will contain all the files created at compilation. If we need to change it, it is easier to change one variable, than a thousand places. The echo will output text on the screen. Next, we have to compile all the C files. The number of options will be huge. We will specify the following options. All warnings, optimize the code, f strength reduce, f omit frame pointer, don't use standard include directory, don't recognize built-in functions. The include folder will be our own, located in kernel, include. Compile, but don't link. Output file will be inside build folder, and in this case it will be called main.o. The input file will be main.c, inside the kernel folder. No strict aliasing, no common, no stack protector. Next, we will compile the assembly files. We use NASM to compile those. The output format will be an ELF executable, input file is loader.asm, and output file will be loader.o. Next, we will link everything together, using LD. The script file will be linker.ld, and the input files will be all object files created in the build folder. The final step is to copy the kernel to a floppy image. To do that, we will make a copy of the floppy image we created in the previous episode. We will need to mount it, just like we did last time. We copy the kernel file on this floppy image, and then unmount the image. Before we test everything works properly, we need to go to properties for this script, and enable permission to execute it. We are ready for the first test. Launch the terminal, that would be SIGWIN on Windows, and navigate to the work directory. To execute the shell put a dot, a slash, and then the file name. The difference between the Linux terminal and the Windows command line, is that Linux doesn't look in the current directory when you want to launch an executable, unless you specify that. The dot means in fact the current directory. We need to launch this script with super user privileges. Apparently, I missed something. I didn't create a build folder. And I also forgot to put a dash o in the nasm command, before the name of the output file. Now it works. Now that everything worked, we can open VirtualBox, and see our kernel in action. It doesn't do anything on the screen, we haven't programmed it to, but this is what you should see. If you see an error message, you should go back and check where you made the mistake. With this, we end this episode. See you next time, when we will learn about memory, and how to output text to the screen.